But then there will be people watching us. That's okay. That's good. Oh, right. can, you, can I borrow that attitude? Or can <laughs> I... oh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, because, um, well, Paul can tell you that the first day I was like, like terrified, like, no. <laughs> Good evening everyone and welcome back to another episode of Analog Television and it's been a great start already in that I accidentally I think went live for a little bit. Um, I'm drinking a stout that I've just found out is eight and a half percent so it's basically a pint of wine and Hussein our guest has disappeared. Um, he said two minutes before we went um, I'm going to get a print hasn't come back. Oh he's back. Is he back? Oh, I'm he's back. back. Okay well Hello, everyone. everything everything is going well we're back on. Here we go let's bring everyone in. 
Hello, Hussein. Hello, Marina. Obviously, Marina. Hello, Welcome guys. Hi, hi. How are you all coping with the heat? Yeah. Just about. Pretty good. Just about. I'm used to. Is good enough. Um, also, for those of us uh, with uh, children, bedtime is not going particularly well. So you may hear <laughs> an extra guest. It's either my wife, baby, or both appear or not. It's fine as long as they talk about film. So, Hussein, welcome. The elusive Hussein. Shall we say? Hello, thanks for having me. Well, when we when we said, um, well, first of all, when, when we first put this out there, that um, people would love to have the great Hussein on the show, Graham immediately was like, he'll never come. I've been trying to get Hussein on Sunny Screen for two years. And here you are. So Graham hasn't really tried that hard, though. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Shots fired. I mean, in fairness, I think he would be the first to say that um, uh, his intention with guests never quite matches the, uh, the organisation. But anyway, no, lovely to have you. Um, Thank you. You met Marina for the first time this evening. Yep. Virtually, but yeah. Yeah. I met you how many years ago? Seven and a half, almost eight years ago. Eight years ago in a whiskey bar in Camden. Mm hmm. There we go. So, um, uh, and that was just after I'd started getting into film properly. Yep. Uh, and I sort of turned up because you were, you, were, you were a colleague of my sister-in-law's <laughs> it was film photography that meant that we met originally. And then we both brought an analog camera to, a, to an evening um, in basically pitch black. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and we, <laughs> drank knew, lots we knew something whiskey. special was going to happen. So you, when did you start in film photography then? Mm. Uh, so my grandmother... Um, always had a camera around. Mm -hmm. She was a big advocate for APS because she could take it to boots and get prints back and get points on her boots card. So she was a big advocate for that whole process. So <laughs> hang on a second, hang on a second. APS. So you've mentioned the, APS even faster than Mike. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this really is the ghost that haunts us all. Okay then. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get all the records this time. <laughs> That's a strong start. Okay, so your grandmother was big Graham, APS. mentioned APS. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always a there's always a film camera sort of at family gatherings. Um, mm. And in 2001, I did a, a summer school for a couple of days. So mm -hmm. I was 11, um, and it was using a film camera, and then someone else developed it, and then we would print from the negatives. Mm -hmm played around so first real access to the darkroom was 11 um, and then noth nothing for ages mm -hmm. um, and then I went to uni I studied mm -hmm. graphic design and they had a darkroom there in a studio mm -hmm. um, and we essentially got given a, a project where we all got to take a Pentax K1000 and mm -hmm. shoot some XP2 it got sent off again, got developed, and then we got probably about a week or so to, to print in the darkroom and learn how to do black and white printing. Um, and then since since then, since sort of 2008, 2009, I've been uh, pretty much consistently shooting film. Nice. Excellent. So with the, um, the graphic design background, do you think that helps, hinders, or is neutral to your photography? Definitely helps with composition. Hmm. It definitely helps sort of take a couple of frames and just take your time, look, look at things differently, try and try and see it in other aspects, not just as a photograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you when you look at your photos now, does it feel like is there any consistency with maybe graphic design work you did before, or have you moved away from graphic design professionally and therefore it's just a totally different world now? It's it's more digital design, which doesn't really correlate anymore. Mm. When you're designing a book where you're dealing more with specific images or specific types, specific colours, um, you don't really have the same sort of finesse mm. in digital design. Yeah. It's all placeholders mm. and down to whatever the yeah. content creators want to put in. Mm. Um, so you're, you're, you're dealing with boxes in digital design, whereas yeah. in print it's, it's the thing that you're creating for production. So... I'd say photography, analog photography, composition is definitely more in line with the print side of stuff than than any of the digital stuff that I do professionally. Mm -hmm. I always find this interesting because it was like when um, when Dan Rubin was on a few weeks ago with his graphic design background and 
the way that he talked about it interacting seemed quite strong. And I come from a, well, as you know, I come from a science background and <laughs> nothing to do with that. And I, I, I often feel like compositionally and some of the basics of like color and everything like that, I definitely am, uh, am catching up, shall we say. Marina, do you, did you have any sort of formal education in things that you think has transitioned well or not to art? Mm, no, I've been always like kind of studying like the same thing, like nothing. So I always related to to photography. Uh, although now I'm um, nothing to do with photography, like mm, trying to learn another other things like marketing and these kind of things. <laughs> so yeah, definitely it helps to promote your work <laughs> as a photographer, but not like the creative side of it, mm. if, if it makes sense. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's not as much photography in a photography business as. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> and and then one of the things I was definitely going to um, uh, ask you about Hussein is because um, I've observed uh, with envy at times the way that you sort of segmented your your work and your travel. So you really enjoy traveling. Mm-hmm. You always take film photographs uh, when traveling. Um, in fact, I've, I've got your Instagram up. We might have a look at your Instagram later. Um, and there's some incredible photos. In fact, I think there was one this morning from Korea. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One thing that people, I think, worry. I think people worry about travel photography with film quite a lot. Hmm. Obviously, it's something mm-hmm. that we all enjoy doing. But you go for weeks or even months at a time. How do you prepare for something like that? Is there something hmm. you do to plan, or is it you just fill your suitcase with clean socks and film and see what happens? <laughs> Pretty much. So that's probably the first thing I pack. It's a it's a selection of film. Um, uh-huh. Usually the staples, Portra, Velvia, um, HP5, FP4, um, and then other oddities. So some double sometimes, some cine mm. films sometimes. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's usually co- cover all the bases. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to come back and feel like I haven't shot enough black and white or feel like I haven't sort of experimented enough and always gone, oh, I've got some Portra 160 Hmm. it's night I'll still shoot it um but generally I take I probably take about 20 to 25 rolls mm-hmm. yeah that's a pretty good amount <laughs> or like a, or like a two I, week I, 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 I always had the uh, ask the same question like when you because I think that when we travel and we and when we are film photographers there is a question that always we do to ourselves like how are we going to actually um put through all our roles through the airport so what do you do in your case i i generally just put it in my hand luggage but um, do you do like an extra care or like like for no, example I, like um the um, films the iso 1600 for example what do you do i don't i tend not to take quite high ISO films mm-hmm. um, I think the highest I usually take is 800 and that's mm-hmm. usually a, a push if I'm going to be shooting that and do you think that will stay okay even like you say 100 I'm not I'm, I'm not sure about higher ISO films now because lots of places have got new scanners yeah that's true um, but previously when I've traveled I, you know uh, Portra 160 or you know Delta 100 has been fine I haven't had any fogging or anything mm. I've, I've messed up films coming back but not not through the actual traveling process hmm. um, this is what we're talking about actually because the um, there's a couple of things one is the sort of the historic advice um and one is then the the things that evolved recently so yeah, as you mentioned a lot of airports are getting new cat scans that are more um powerful hmm. but odak and ilford have both released statements on saying yes this can damage your film historically not so much frankly mm-hmm. not in hand luggage um and yeah. The old days of like doing a lead-lined bag, a bad idea because basically the, these days the volume could be turned up and it would just blitz anything that moved. Um, and I think it was, I can't remember who was saying it to me, but it might have been Mike from FPP was saying that actually um, the role that he's had most fault is one that was in his camera in his hand luggage. Okay. Because when it's rolled up, there's actually a lot of protection apart from the very outside, which is often mm-hmm. the leader anyway, stops a lot of the radiation. Mm-hmm. If you you get radiation from being in a plane high up in altitude, and when it's then in the camera, it's thinner, it's rolled out, and you can get more fogging there. Um, but the new thing, I mean, again, we're sort of learning as we go a little bit. Mm. But hand luggage uh, has to be hand examined, um, generally okay. Mm-hmm. When you talk there about you take a whole mishmash of films, um, 
And I think that's one of the reasons why we've always enjoyed photo ops together, <laughs> because we both come from that, you know. Uh, well, I, I know that I'm, I'm always saying I'm never somebody who's going to be disciplined to just shoot Tri-X for a year and learn it yeah. really well. Um, do you deliberately, how do you think about that? Do you, do you try and hit every ISO, every, like, portrait to landscape, to, so you have a map of everything? Or do you think, I'm going to Tokyo, I want to take this film there? How do you approach it? Is it is what's the method? I think. Uh, I I really like the latitude of Portra One Sixty. <laughs> I can shoot that at night, and I can get really nice shots with detail in highlights and shadows. Um, I've shot. I I usually take some cheap film, so some Lomo Eight Hundred, Lomo One Hundred. Um, and try and interleave some of the shooting. So mm -hmm. at least, uh, you know, if I'm if I finish a roll, I'll chuck a, a roll of uh, Lomo in, shoot that, and then switch to something nice. So it's not necessarily shooting specifically for a, a scene. Mm -hmm. um, it's more if I if I feel like I haven't shot enough black and white, mm -hmm. I'll try and shoot some black and white. Or if if it's starting to get dark, I try and shoot something a bit faster. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very environmental in that sense. Yeah. Um, it, it, sometimes it means I come back and I don't like any of the images. Oh. <laughs> but I think that's part of the process. Well, true. And what do you do normally? So there, like, let's say that you've shot, like, 10 rows there. Do you normally mm, get them developed there on the site? Or, or do you do them there or you when you go back? My, my first time in Japan was in 2014 um, okay. and I developed all my J Japan films there just because oh, so I wanted to see them. Hang on but then you brought with you all the uh, all, all the tanks? Oh really? <laughs> oh, no 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 I, I got it developed in a... Ah okay. Oh so I was about to say like you can just in, imagine two uh, suitcases. And like, I, yeah I, I was thinking oh, wow that's another level. <laughs> <laughs> oh I need to I'm going away for um, two months no, what I, do I need I, my development <laughs> phase yeah. I think in that in that case, I was traveling for three months, so it made sense to start developing yeah, and not carry mm. around a, a bunch of canisters. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I generally, yeah, I, I just bring stuff back and develop it here. Um, mm -hmm. And do you see any difference between the the labs that you, there or and the the labs that here in the U, in rural? Is there any difference between like the services or? that anything that you particularly no no not really I, the the get it on cd as standard was quite nice in japan mm. huh. it was like it you didn't even have to ask they were just like right you're getting it on cd you're getting sort of mediums like res scans and everything was sort of meticulous in a very japanese way um, true yep <laughs> um, and they you know they ask if you want it cut uh, in fours or sixes, which is yeah. nice as well. Which is really nice. We normally we don't do that. Like we like hearing at, at least in in Europe that uh, we assume that you want them like fours. <laughs> but I used to have it where one of the labs I used to use always cut negatives in sixes and slides in eight. What? It was That's really so, strange. It was so annoying. I think it was because they had they had the you know the actual um, proper see-through transparent um sleeve holders for slides so you can just immediately shove it up to the light and i don't know whether they'd bought it in bulk or as a wide one or something anyway most annoying thing <laughs> ever to try and file <laughs> yeah because then they're like the strips will be like super long yeah <laughs> yeah it was ridiculous yeah so, so marini were you in japan then at the same time then when were you in shooting film in japan i, I think uh but, 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 so i was there in 2011, I think. Yeah, 2011, I was there. So, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I would have overlapped. I think maybe we <laughs> were in the same city <laughs> Probably, at some yeah. point. Mm, or yeah. We, yeah, or we cross our sites in, in Tokyo. You need to go Just back and pictures. Check, check your film, <laughs> take your photos at that time. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God, Marina's there. Um, can you imagine? Can you imagine that actually happened? <laughs> well, there was a one on Petapix, I think, a couple of years ago where um, it was a, a couple who got married and then they realised that they're taking photos of each other on a tourist site like years and years before. Oh. Um, so maybe, maybe that'll happen. Um, 
so when you um so you you develop you used to develop now you sort of you bring them back and then you you do a lot of developing yourself yes you do all of it yourself yeah. back in the uk yes yeah uh, um so i um i'm part of the collective and dark room um called e5 process um hmm. and i sort of help them sort of figure out some of the color printing and some of the color developing so we've got um chemistry to develop e6 c41 ec2n um, and then all of the color processing stuff as well all color printing stuff as well mm-hmm. um all of that's been very much trial and error but it's been a really fun journey trying to understand all the chemistry and all the mm-hmm. like processes for that um but i prior to any of that stuff i was i was using e5 uh, for black and white printing mm. um, and that itself has been really nice to have a space and a community that you can mm. you can talk to someone else and go oh have you tried this or have you tried this oh. process yeah um, and, and a lot of people get um we talked about this briefly before we, we went live get a little bit scared of color developing mm. e6, definitely the dreaded remjet of cine film do you think it helps being part of a community darkroom that, that someone else might have tried it or at least there's someone else who at least is doing it new and you're both making mistakes and that's fine. It's, it's a bit of both, but yeah, I think I just, just being able to point at something and have a, a, another set of eyes on it helps so much with your confidence and going, yeah, that isn't right. Or yeah, that is right. And that is the distinction between going, I don't know what I'm doing and stressing out and not doing it properly or not mm-hmm. seeing things properly. And then just going, it'll work out. It might be a bit <laughs> funny, but it'll work out. <laughs> yeah. I think that the E6, uh, E6 and C41, there were always uh, sort of the voices saying, it's too hard, you've got to be in within 0.5 degrees Celsius tolerance. And I found that it doesn't, it's not that, it's not that specific. Um, it, it cares more about like general temperatures. As long as you're within a couple of percent, it's, it's fine. You don't have to go, oh no, it's dropped five to, like 0.5 degrees. It's all ruined, it's going to go all blue yeah. uh, so it's a lot easier than people might say it is especially what, after a few times yeah and when when you say um because i think that temperature thing is definitely one of the concerns and that's where things like the cv or the sinistil temperature control can help with home developing because it just really mm, yeah. um and and i always say this as well because present week accepted <laughs> the temperature in the uk room temperature in the uk doesn't move much beyond 21 degrees plus or minus two is that the temperature that you'd use or do you does it need to be warmer than that colder than that for for ambient temperature yeah um i find if it's so in the winter it's it's a bit of a pain because Mm -hmm. it's hard keeping warmer chemistry warm Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and it's hard to bring when it's really cold and it's like eight degrees it's hard to bring black and white chemistry up to 20 degrees yeah. because you're often over- overshoot just because it's too cold so you can't gauge how how long it's going to be in there for um but i mean we we don't have sort of he- heating or um like air conditioning at the dark room mm-hmm. it's whatever ambient temperatures there um what we do have is a big sort of um patterson bath uh-huh. and it's the amount of water that's there that keeps the temperature quite consistent it's not necessarily about like whether you're a couple of degrees too high or too low as long as it's as long as it doesn't change rapidly Hmm. Um, you get something called reticulation if you change the temperatures too much and it Mm -hmm. creates a really funky pattern but essentially it contracts and swells the gelatin or the emulsion and you get all of these wrinkles on the surface of the film so as long as you're not going from very hot to very cold, you yeah. can kind of avoid that. Yeah. Um, and Rachel's just written in actually saying, do you use anything to keep it temperature controlled? So that Patterson tank, but do you do anything else like while it's going? No. Um, generally, the developer is three and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. The bleach and the fix are about six minutes each. Okay. So with, in, that, in that amount of time, it's yeah. fine. And with them, let's talk, uh, let's talk Remjet, because again, in fact, there was something on Instagram today where Ben Mills, hip shoot film, who I think is, uh, has joined us, is um, offering up um, some vision roles for people who are up for it. 
And, um, and Mike on FPP the other day was giving us the whole, the only thing that's called remjet removal is your fingers. You just need to wipe it off. Stop whinging. Young <laughs> um, do you, do you use remjet removal? Do you just wipe it off? Do you worry about it? Uh, yeah. So we, we keep, a we keep, um, any C41 chemistry that's used for cine film separate because mm. even if you think you've washed it, well, you haven't, and <laughs> mm. it's you, you have to wash it so much to get the the particles of the yeah. carbon off. Um, there's there's always going to be that, but if you keep it separate, it's kind of fine. We also filter anything that goes through cine film, mm. like with actual paper filters. Oh. Um, so we try and minimise any of that sort of cross contamination yeah. and the, the grittiness that you get from it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it works really well. The remjet remover it 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 softens it, mm-hmm. and with with some sort of aggressive washing and shaking, you can get rid of most of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do sort of see a degradation of of quality of your chemistry. Everything gets a lot darker. Uh, mm. so by the time it gets to the stabilizer it's usually fine but then you've got to wash it and then sort of wipe off the negatives um yeah i don't i don't know if uh no no if there's any helpful. better way marina from your do you you don't do it in the lab do you does photography cover cine film uh, nope <laughs> no have you done no, it yourself it's... personally me no no no, no. i uh... <laughs> I no, I have never done it personally. But what I can tell you is that I accidentally uh, develop a film, a cine film, with the without, I mean, with the remjet, and I put and I put it through the processor. Oh no! <laughs> so yeah, when when you said uh, you when you think that you wash everything. And you did. You don't. I really felt that. Like, yeah, I remember that evening um, <laughs> watching everything. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time, I'm not going to make that mistake ever. Because I mean, you have to uh, wash in an entire machine, so <laughs> not a tank. So yeah. Does do you think everyone knows what remjet or cine film is compared to normal film? Yeah. <sighs> Not many people, to be honest. No. Mm. I mean, no. just as an, just my, an example. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. Let's, let's do it. Ah, okay. So, um, that's Northern Lab. 250D. That is Northern Lab. Uh, um, Northern Lab, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Who are on eBay. I don't think they have a separate mm-hmm. site today. It's eBay, yeah. Um, but, but there's a black um, layer mm. in uh-huh. the... Shiny Hang on, shiny. I'm just going to zoom in so it's um, just you on the screen. There we go. It's all you, buddy. Yep. <laughs> um, and that, that blocks light, um, but, but it's only on the shiny side. Um, and what that allows you to do is when you've got big rolls of this to put into movie cameras, mm-hmm. you can do that without a changing bag. So you can do that in, in normal daylight because it's wound up and then no light gets through. And that's that's what that's for. Um and when it goes through the actual camera, light won't pass through it, hit the back of the camera plate, and then bounce back and create halos. Oh. So that's why you see the halos on cine film, because they've got rid of the remjet. Mm-hmm. Um, so then you don't have the that layer to stop that haloing. Interesting. Um, I didn't know that. But because this is a carbon layer, mm-hmm. it, it needs to be dissolved before you can sort of shine light through it yeah. and scan it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also dissolves in some of the colour chemistry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but not completely so <laughs> what happens is you have to put it through a, a pre-bath which mm-hmm. then gets rid of that black layer and then makes this normal sort of colour film huh. That's interesting so when when people say about the EC, uh, EC2N ECN2 EC R2D2 and um, yeah. is that then is that then pre bath plus C forty one effectively? It's pre bath plus RA four, which is the same stuff you use for colour paper. Ah. Uh-huh. But it's just yeah, you can use C forty one as well. So mm-hmm. the, the reds more than anything come through more if you do it through RA four. And and just so uh, people are gonna clear like Sinistil, the Sinistil is 
cine film with that carbon layer pre-removed for you mm -hmm. and the reason you get as you say this the the halo the halos on cine still famously um is busy say because normal color films have an anti-halation layer mm -hmm. that means they don't need to worry about that bounce back mm -hmm. interesting i didn't know that that it was it basically allows it to daylight load bulk that's I mean, yeah that's the premise of it and when you've got big reels um i found out that those only last about two minutes of filming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if you're filming a long scene you've got to change those out constantly um, so it makes sense to be able to yeah. swap them yeah, out really quickly you get to run off to the dark room every time yeah <laughs> with this gigantic cine film camera like, everyone pause everyone pause <laughs> <laughs> stay where you are we'll be back in a minute yeah mm. the other tidbit is there's a barcode on on them and uh -huh. you can look up you can look up that barcode to when it was made so potentially what you're shooting in a rolled up version you can look up when it was made and who could potentially have ordered it really? so which other films the same stock would have been used on uh -huh. Uh -huh. there we go the, the um the, the cine films i mean the fact that so many hollywood movies are still shot on film is the reason we still have um a kodak <laughs> business in stills because um everything is derived from that so every time what is it cone brothers famously spielberg still shoots on it um tarantino still shoots on it mm. um, more people coming back to it as well and obviously a load of, of other directors as well we thank them every time because <laughs> that's what <laughs> that's helped us mm -hmm. and also gives us the uh, the cine still and also uh, people who, who do the vision do you do you have a preferred film? So you like to take a lot with you on holiday. You've shot a lot. You've experimented a lot. Do you have one that you'd be like, I love this one? Are we? Can I? Can I do one for black and white and one for color? Yeah, please do. Sure. Yeah. Because the the black and, and white film. <clears throat> and what? Sorry. And slide. And slide film, please. Yeah. <laughs> and slide. Well, Velvet Fifty for slides. Ah. And APS. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can't really get hold of it anymore, can you? <laughs> Beats advantage. Um, for colour, it's got to be Portra 160. Mm -hmm. I've, I've really put it put it through its paces um, in all sorts of conditions, and it's just held up beautifully. Um, for black and white, it's it's a split, I guess, between Delta 100 and Burger Pancro 400. Oh, oh nice. the, the first time I shot Burger, I was really disappointed with the negatives. Why? Before I'd scanned it or anything, it looks really flat. Mm. It looks really grey. Mm -hmm. And then I scanned it and I was blown away. It's really, really nice. Um, the greys are high silver content. So to your visible eye, it looks like it's all murky. But then when you scan it or print it in the dark room, it's beautiful. It's got so much like detail. Okay. Oh. I didn't know it. I haven't personally shot that, the, that film yet. Yeah, I mean, it's only it only came to market reasonably recently. I mean, 120 was last Bergen. year. Is, that, is it the, the 100 that you saw you said? 400. Oh, 400. Mm. Okay. Mm. And then Delta 100. So what do you see that versus uh, the classic HP5? Oh, there's so much more detail in uh, Delta 100. Mm. HP5 is great for contrast, mm. but for 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 detail in the shadows and the highlights, the Delta 100 just does such a great job, um, especially if you're printing. Mm. Um, when you're pr when I've when I've been printing with HB5, I found that I can't really go past sort of 16, 12. Mm -hmm. But with um, uh, this is printing from a 35 frame, not from mm -hmm. a medium format. Um, but with Delta 100, I can basically shoot as big as I want and just scale in. Um, and crop in as much as I want, and it's it's fantastic. It's just got so much detail. Mm. So you can shoot thirty five mil and not worry about the resolution or the printing size. No, that's super powerful. Um, and do you? Uh, I'm, I'm finding it hard to ask questions that I know other people might not know. <laughs> We've done a lot of uh, shooting videos. Uh, do you shoot more thirty five mil or medium format, or a bit of a mix? Uh, I only really have toy cameras for medium format. And okay. I've got loads of really nice films I want to shoot on, like a Bronica or a Mamiya. Uh -huh. um, but I've only got Holgers and Dianas for medium format, so I don't really shoot all that often. Um, 35mm is my bread and butter. Mm. 
Oh. And what is the camera that you usually use? I have it right here. Oh, what a lead in. What a lead in. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Let me, let's go to the, the full on Hussein view so you can show. Go on then, Hussein. Talk us through it. And that is a Nikon FM3A. I think it's a 1.850 on there. Um, this is it's bulletproof. Um, I've fallen off the bike and completely dented the prism. And then no. it's It's been fine. Hmm. Um, it's, I mean, it's got a really nice patina going on from sort of rubbing and use, but this, I think I've had probably about nine years. I was going to ask you, like, when years. did you, when, where did you buy it? Um, Aperture. Ah, Aperture. So Aperture UK on Museum Street. Um, I think they've hmm. moved to Rathbone Place now, but, um, when they, when they were just that shop, um, they, they are website. now in a really fancy shop. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is this camera is the the FM family and the FE family um, in one camera. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've also so, got some more nicknames coming in. Cherilee's <laughs> called it the Golden Boy. Um, <laughs> the, the Golden tank. Boy. The Tank. Palmer, yeah. The Legend. <laughs> The beauty of the, the, the beauty is beauty. I, I don't know. I, I love that camera. Yeah. Oh, I also have. Another? <laughs> he has three more. He just has. Seeing as, seeing as uh, um, Cheryl Lee's just mentioned the FMTN. Oh, Whoa. Is that? <laughs> I, say, uh, I think that's FM. I think that's an FM2N as well, but a titanium one. Um, and it's got a ridiculous lens on there. Yeah, I was about to say, that's the one where you want to definitely be noticed. <laughs> well, <laughs> well we've, got, um, we've got a bird feeder yes, just outside yes. my window. Have you ever, now that I think about it, have you ever asked for a portrait with that lens? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to walk to the other side of the like, room. Sorry, <laughs> how long? <laughs> Is it, I really like your top. Do you mind taking a photo? Walk, walk three miles away and up a building. Um. But this is this is the FM three A is definitely the, the workhorse. Um, yeah, I can't fault it. The light meter's spot on with the yeah. lens. And I know. One of the one of the big reasons that I got this was um, the split prism focusing. So right in the middle, um, there's a circle of the viewfinder, and it's split in half. Mm -hmm. um, and the two images shift in and out of sync. So if if you're focusing at something in the distance, you can just line up a sort of a, a mm. vertical horizontal, and then once it's in in line, then you know it's in focus. And for me, that was fantastic because I wasn't mm. worried about focusing anymore. So then I could focus on composition and timing and all the other fun stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you own any point and shoot? Because, for example, in my case. You know, with the lockdown, I always, you know, I mean, I felt very lazy, like just going with the SLR. But what about you? Do you feel the same? None, or? none that work. <laughs> none? Come on. Um, How so many do you have? How many? Oh. The LCA wide or LCW. Uh -huh. um, but I dropped it and it doesn't work. So, but this was my pocket camera. Oh, no. Um, so what, what, why does it not work now? Well, because it dropped it, but in terms of how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, the shutter, the trigger for the shutter is stuck down. Mm. So I can't take any pictures because it's constantly thinking the shutter's pressed down. Uh -huh. So I could probably open it up and get it fixed. Um, we actually, me and Paul actually had a, an episode trying to fix his LCA oh, a couple God. of years ago. You really miss your train. <laughs> Do you want to tell that story? Well, I'll tell it how I remember it, but the stress might make me forget bits. So um, it was when I was living in Yorkshire and Hussein had come up um, uh, for, for the weekend. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what was it? It was something I'd said, oh, there's something wrong with my LCA. And he was like, he had to get the train back towards London in the afternoon. And it was at lunchtime. It had a, quite a bit of time. I was like, there's something, something, I can't remember what it wasn't quite working but it's something around the front I think the shutter was getting stuck or mm -hmm. the, yeah or the the lens caps getting stuck and the same was like well that's fine we can just open it up and and fix it it'll take like five minutes and I was like really oh that'd be brilliant it'll bring back the LCA that's fantastic and then we we <laughs> took off the front plate lifted it uh -huh. off and then there was like a ping 
And this was it. It was a ball bearing, wasn't it? It's a tiny, tiny ball bearing. Really? Tiny, tiny. <laughs> How like come? Size of a pin, something. And it was. Um, yeah. It's it's the one that that when it slides across, it locks it in place slightly. Um, <laughs> it pinged off and flew away. And we were like, okay, well, we found it pretty fast. Good news. How do you get it back in? And that was where it really happened. Because it was like, how do you put something the size of a pin into something else that was behind something else? And they were like, two of us trying, but it's, your fingers are getting in the way, your head's knocking each other. <laughs> we're trying to use tweezers. Tweezers were too big. Mm. It, it, and then Hussein felt really guilty, bless him, for <laughs> that. He said, I can fix this camera. And it wasn't even a big problem. You could still use the camera. Now you could not use the camera. Mm. Um, I think you felt a bit guilty. So he was yeah. there, like... <laughs> you did. <laughs> And you know one of those things where every time it gets close, and thing gets there, and then the last second it just pops off and rolls across the table. And you're like, oh, was that is that fair, Hussein? If I mistake. Yeah, it was no, that's spot on. Um, we we did manage to do it. I think we spent about an hour, maybe yeah. forty five minutes, and I, I probably oh. ended up fifteen minutes before I had to go. Yeah. Um, and we I think we just used a bit of tape and just managed it somehow. Yeah, Hussein's idea was to put the <laughs> the the um the ball bearing on a piece of sticky tape, so then he can maneuver it. And then you just need to poke Slide it, it under a spring. A Genius. But yeah, it was like an hour of stress. And when it went in, it was like, we, it was just like, oh, thank God that's done. Rather than relieved. We'd gone past that point. <laughs> yeah. That's like, such a shame. Never again. That's such a shame because I remember you, you loved the LCA wide. I mean, I've, I remember borrowing yours and not really getting it. It felt too, like the LCA is already quite wide. But you always so the, the but this one's the wide. I had the normal LCA, but um, the the plastic on the old ones degrade quite quickly, and oh. the the knob had kind of just worn the tape up. Um, this bit had worn off, and the new one cost about fifty quid on eBay. So I was just like, well, I'll just get the next one up. So this was quite fun. Um, again, nice and small, fits in jacket pocket really, really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I guess not really going out and point shooting at the moment which is oh. mm. but you don't feel that like sometimes like very lazy like oh i kind of i don't have like the mood of taking in this a lot we think it's too heavy or do i just you're the kind of person of yeah no um, the, the, the nikon comes out with me all the time so uh, every well. time every time i've gone on a photo with the saying he's got this big rucksack and he'll have a camera on his neck, and then halfway through, he'll be like, oh, I'll show you this. And he opens his rucksack, and there's like three <laughs> other cameras inside. <laughs> You're like, why are you carrying around like half a ton of weight? But then, <laughs> then he has so many ca like brilliant cameras. Mm. So what's your, um, what's your pocket camera, Marina? Ooh, I have actually, I think, can I, can I show it? I have it around oh, yeah, here. Yeah. By the way, I think yeah. it should also be a competition, like, who, out of everyone listening, how many cameras does everyone have I'll be there. One within second. arm's reach? Like arm's reach. <laughs> like, you're allowed to, okay, you're allowed to, like, slide around a little bit, but how many cameras can you touch within a couple of paces? Does, does this one count, Paul? What is, what is that? Oh, my God, what is, yes, it does. What, what is that? <laughs> um, it's from a vending machine yeah. in Japan. Um, and the great thing is the lens comes off. <laughs> The, the viewfinder bit comes off. Oh, is that? Have you, and it's got articulation. Have you tried to turn that into a real camera yet, like a pinhole or something? I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting on, yeah, I'm waiting on getting my dog bag back from the dark room, and then we'll have some tiny, tiny. Because uh, I've got some, from... I've got some microfilm coming in from America soon, that uh, might be the size you're looking for. <laughs> okay, right then. So the first number is F Watson. We were saying, Marina, how many how many cameras do you have within arm's reach? So F Watson's got two. I've got three, although one's an SLR, one's a pinhole, and one is technically a camera, although it's still in its construction. <laughs> it's a uh, the Scura from uh, Dora Goodman that I uh, I need to put together. Um, but Lizzie Wayne. Oh, here we go, Lizzie Wayne. Um, oh, hang on a minute. I've just been handed another one there. There's four. That's my daughter, <laughs> technically. Very, it's, it's, it's oh, very fantastic. creative. Let's see if we can see. Very creative uh, lens. Um, Lizzie has said she can't touch them, but there's 20 in a drawer under her bum. Whoa. Really? They are 11 <laughs> within arm's reach. 11. I think I've got eight. Eight? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got eight here. Okay, right. Oh my god, no, I feel ashamed. <laughs> right, go on then, Marina. Sorry, we've taken uh, away I your, mean, uh... nearby, I only have two. Go on then, show us, show us what you want. What are they? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> these are now my lovely ones. Like really, these to help me out. It's a bit complicated. So just just say which cameras they are, Marina. So this is the Nikon One Touch Zoom Ninety. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the the Nikon uh, Zoom Seventy WS. Nice. Yeah. So these two really helped me out to like, you know, because um, on the lockdown I was like very like mm, not in the mood. I'm not mm -hmm. taking photos, and then I thought mm, I should really get need to get a a point and shoot and start not making excuses myself like oh i don't want to take the my camera with me the nestler so i just bought these two and then helped me out to create well be creative again and enjoy again taking photos just uh, for fun i yeah, do i do fun. think um that having something that is pocketable is one of the best i look at that sound <laughs> protection for that kind of thing i think it was stephen dowling from the photo he said that the he once said to me, or it might have been in an article, he said the best <laughs> the best um, solution for a creative block is an LCA. Because for him, again, that's that pocket camera that you're like, you can't, you can't go to the pub with an LCA and not take a few photos. It's just impossible. Because it's pocket, and I think it's the pocket size thing. Actually, mine's broken and, and I really miss it because I've then got my, my Olympus Trip 35 is like my small, but it's not quite pocket size. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the winter it would be with big pockets, but it won't fit in shorts. Like you know. Anyway, um, listen, it's quarter to nine, which means it's probably time for a little quiz. Now, we brought on a lot of people to say how well do you know, and normally they're representing a brand or a business or at least a website or a podcast. Hussein has a wonderful Instagram page. He has a uh, a, 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 a website. Um, you've been in Flickr before. But Marina, I believe, got a little bit creative with this week. Yeah. So I'm just going to dip it into <laughs> no the to these things. Marina will have her, I'm sure, a costume change. And then, one second. <laughs> one second. And then we will do, how well do you know Hussein? How do you feel, Hussein? Do you feel confident that you know yourself? I think so. Oh, goodness, that's sparkly. <laughs> I feel underdressed now. Oh, you um, guests are also welcome to do a costume change for the quiz. That's encouraged. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm putting any hand Oh, on Marina, you look amazing. Yes. Okay, then, right, I will zoom nice. out. Over to you. Hello, Hussein. Now you are Hello. mine for just a few minutes, I think. All righty, so this is the section where I ask you, like, how well you know yourself in this time, how Hussein knows Hussein himself. So I have five questions for you today. And as Paul said, uh, uh, I had to ask some birds around them <laughs> <laughs> about this thing. So ahem. the first question is, let's see if you remember. So. What was the film that you used to take the portraits that you did of Paul last time that you met on Oxford with him? And you posted on Instagram. Uh, if it's the blue one, that would have been uh, stereo, double film stereo. Yeah, well, I, I, I thought that it was bubblegum, but yeah, it's a stereo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was the blue one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, looked like, it looked like stereo, but I think you tagged oh, yeah, it. Hashtag bubblegum. Bubblegum. Oh, did I? Whoops. <laughs> the blame is on you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I can... i give you a point. Yeah. Right. So, so, so. Uh, well, I think this is the, the second one. It's a little bit tricky. Because this thing happened like... Mm, Many many years ago, I think to, back in 2017. So when, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I've been doing some research. So okay. <laughs> about you, um, okay. So when is the time of the day that you told us that you feel the most productive moments when it comes to printing your photographs in the dark room? Oh, in the morning. In the morning. In the day. And why? Yeah. I was like, yes, uh, correct. Because right, <laughs> um, I've, I've had a coffee. <laughs> Thanks for the applause. Um, uh, yeah, in the morning, it, your eyes are fresh and it's really hard to 
judge color shifts when your eyes are tired Mm -hmm. and it's dark so in the morning if you can just go outside and see some daylight see your prints in the daylight um yeah you 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 can make the changes really quickly have you ever tried to do it like in late in the evening uh, Mm. like with a with a beer or something yeah no absolutely i don't think you can feel productive like with a beer (laughs) It takes about three times as long to get where I want to get. <laughs> mm. All right. Mm. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So, 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 this is might be a lot of, a, another tricky question. So, <laughs> and this is a very personal question as well. So, oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, last time that you met Rob from London Camera Project, you went to his house and you had really good chat and everything. But there is something that Rob showed you that he was keeping in his fridge. Do you remember what Rob showed you? I was in the fridge, like very precious things. <laughs> I No, I don't remember. <gasps> oh, my God. Hang on. How dare you? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, so something on the fridge, but it is not food. <laughs> I was going to say frozen peas, but no, I don't know. I can't remember. <gasps> oh, my gosh. She, oh, she, sorry. He show you <clears throat> a APS stash in the freezer <laughs> and two rows of natural uh, 1600, which he was like very excited about to show you, but you don't remember anymore, don't you? No, sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> 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 My my brain just shut off as uh, <laughs> that came into conversation. Oh well, um, yeah. And the fourth question is something to do with Rob as well. So, uh, what is the meaning of the stash nuts not film hashtag <laughs> that you both used? You only used <sighs> you and Rob. Why? Well, I have three options. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> Option number A. Stashing nuts contributes film photography's inspiration. Option B, keeping nuts next to your films helps to keep film fresh. Option number C, don't say film, use it, please. I love B, but uh, C. Yes! <laughs> Correct. I think, I think that was... um. That was because Rob was uh, was saying that he wanted to buy more film, uh-huh. even though he had not shot some of the film that I'd given him. So I was like, don't be a film oh. squirrel. Stop <laughs> stashing your film. Ah, that's right. <laughs> so when was the last time that you used it, by the way? Or you just used it like to... Uh... It's, it's only with Rob, really. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so we came to we are not we're now in the last very last question, and it's something personal as well. <clears throat> so when you met last time with Sarah Smith, where did you meet, and what did you purchase with her? We went to Mr. Cad in Victoria, which if no if you haven't been there, if you I've, if I've, not, been, I've been I've been it's paradise yeah. It's, Oh, it's it's a treasure trove of just yeah. <laughs> everything. It's they've got cine cameras, they've got like old folding cameras, they've got yeah. large format, they've got they've just got everything really. Um, I bought a a lens. Uh-huh. I bought that fifty actually. I bought this this lens here. Ah, oh, really? And I bought some color paper, some expired color paper. That's, that was the answer. Yeah, correct. Oh. <laughs> and. I mean, this is just a uh, curious because uh, your bird told me that you were planning to do like a photo work, but what happened that day? Oh, it rained like nobody's business. It was torrential rain, <laughs> <laughs> so we just hid in a pub uh, after going to the. Uh, and what, what you were talking about was like, was it film or? Well, probably mostly film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So four out of five. Nice work. Nice. I let Rob down, but I make it up Well, he will he won't forgive you then. <laughs> no, good quiz, Marina. I love it. Yeah. Hussein has um keeps a low profile with the uh 
the special yeah, needs in it was Spain. really hard. Actually, I had to ask Paul, like, Paul, um, um, can, how can I do this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. And you've been, um, I think, an, a, a central part of the London film scene for, uh, for quite a while, which I think why um, a lot of people know you. You've taught a lot of people mm-hmm. things. Actually, when you were saying this, I, I had a memory that actually you were the first person to teach me developing film. Mm. Um, which was when you, it was before E5, it was when you were in a shared, it's a shared studio workshop with your friend, wasn't it? In uh, mm. uh, East London near, where was it? It was near Hackney? Mm-hmm. There we go. Yeah, off Morning Lane. Um, yeah, I, I used to have a studio where I... Oh, uh, really? It was, it was a friend's studio and she needed someone to cover some of the rent. So mm. I um, paid probably about 150 quid. To, to use the space and I, yeah. I think I lived in Camden at the time so I'd walk from Camden to um, Hackney um, mm-hmm. I'd have all my developing stuff there all my tanks all my chemistry there mm-hmm. and just um, develop it develop stuff on the weekend yeah. um, not, not enough space to print or anything it wasn't a light proof room or anything um, I only really got back into that when I started working with E5 mm-hmm. um, but I think we went on a photo walk in, I think in St. Paul's, and I think we walked down to the Thames. Yeah. And then it got to about I don't know, six, and I was like, do you want to come back to the studio and develop the film that you just shot? So yeah, I, I, I've got a photo of uh, Paul and Lizzie in lab coats oh. developing. <laughs> That's because, um, yeah, Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Wayne, I think, is watching along as well, was uh, the third third musketeer in that um in that situation so the printing side so i wanted to bring this up as well um yeah. the because i know you you print quite a lot um and again i think that's something that people who are very comfortable shooting very comfortable even developing then hit this roadblock of they're worried about printing and even i've said it to you as well you've given me the speech because i've done black and white printing and that's okay because you don't need to you you know you, you sort out the exposure you sort out the size you do the test it's you can learn that in an evening or a couple of evenings. Mm, now it's yeah. colour printing is like, poof, you've got to worry about so many more things. And you yeah. said to me, nope, it's not that hard. Do you want to give that speech to the wider group? <laughs> <laughs> to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, you've had any, if you've had any experience um, printing with black and white, um, you only really have to worry about contrast and exposure. Mm. You, you, mm-hmm. change your, you change your grade um you change your, your multi-grade to you know a, a two or a four and then you get a certain amount of contrast out of your negative and then you adjust your exposure to get the right sort of image that you want um with color printing your exposure and your color balance hmm. are linked so if you where you can get sort of higher contrast with sort of the rough roughly the same amount of exposure time or the same amount of light. Um, with color, if you change your exposure, your colors change. And if you change the colors, then your exposure changes. Hmm. So you're having to juggle the the color shifts as well as the exposure time. So once you kind of understand that a bit more and just go, right, there's just something else I need to think about. There's another axis to this sort of graph. Hmm. It becomes quite easy because, you know, adding more, of a certain color will affect your exposure time and hmm. that's the big hurdle that people have it's like I've, I've got the color right but the exposure is not quite there and it's just because both things are moving and you have to like balance both of them so, so the when you i know sorry Marina, you've got something so the, when you say that that sounds that sounds to me like color curves in any photo editing software mm-hmm. in the world right like you can drop the if you drop if you kill the red it changes the color and darkens the image is that is it that like that exactly the same yeah okay. like if, if you're familiar with the digital stuff it's so much easier to understand um color printing mm-hmm. i think what trips people up is it's the opposite so you've got three colors you've got cyan magenta and yellow in terms of filtering um if your end result is slightly too magenta instead of reducing your filtering you add more filtering to min- so because to magenta yeah. run. So the, if your if your image is slightly to magenta, then you have to add more. You, you have to add more filtering of the magenta filter, ah. and that reduces it. So it's a bit backwards because you think, 
right, it's too magenta, so I need to take away magenta. Yeah. But it's the opposite. And I'm trying to think how how to like. Well, is is that the same then? Is that the same as I'm trying to think through? So again, just tying it to other pieces. So when you when you do it, when you add a filter, a color filter to a film, it's the same thing, right? You you're looking to cut things out. Filtering cuts things out. It doesn't add to mm. it. So that's always the the trick. Precisely. It's not it's it's not adding light. It's taking away that color. Yeah. Precisely. Hmm. Okay. I think what what trips people up is this, there's usually three filters on a color printing head. So there's cyan, there's magenta, there's yellow. Um, if you change all three, all you're doing is you're adding neutral density. Uh -huh. So you're just blocking more light on all of the filters at the same amount. So then your exposure time has to go up. Yeah. Got it. If you change two of those filters and leave one alone, mm -hmm. all you're doing is you're changing the colors. Mm. Mm. Makes sense. Okay. So it the, the exposure does change very, very slightly, mm -hmm. but it's not a neutral density change. It's not a factor of sort of power to two. Mm -hmm. So you're not having to go up a whole stop if you're changing all three a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Got it. Which again, if I, if I take it back to playing around in Photoshop or, or any photo editing, that's the same thing, right? Like if you want to push exposure, you see all three color curves move together. Yes. And if you exactly. if you change the color, you see, but not touch exposure, you see them spread, but not shift. The tough Precisely. thing is the software is trying to think that through for you a little bit in the computer, whereas you're saying, no, you move one, everything moves. <laughs> you just need to know everything, yeah. how. Yeah. <laughs> It, the, the fun thing with this, though, is it, it becomes really intuitive. Mm -hmm. So once you start printing a little bit, you know where to start and you know how much to change by. Um, mm. they, they use units called CC. So you, you basically have three, three numbers for your filtering. So um, with Fuji paper, it's usually something around the ballpark of 0, 40, 35. With Kodak, it might be something different. It might be 0, 65, 30. And essentially, that's a really strong starting point to know mm -hmm. that whatever you put in, you're going to be able to get the colors roughly to where you need to get to. And then it's just a case of changing it so it's like, oh, it's too blue, so I need to increase the filters to get it to be less blue. And that mm -hmm. is actually, actually what... what so I was about to oh, say, Ben Mills cool. has just pinged in saying, he's, I think it's on the same thing. So do you do test strips for color printing and set everything to zero? Whereas you're saying, well, effectively you're told by the manufacturer what zero is for that film. Uh, so when when you send off a roll of film to get scanned, mm -hmm. there's a profile in the machine that has all yeah. of this stuff for the film. So when you're printing with film onto paper that's from a different manufacturer, yeah. you've got these two profiles that might not match so then you have to work out what the balance is to get both of them to be true to life um so different films will react to different paper different and and if you're for example printing a frame from a portrait 160 what would you say that is the the best uh photographic paper for it you can get fuji crystal archive really easily mm -hmm. i think it's something like it's like thirty-five pounds for a ten by eight pack of hundred. Wow, no, no, not that it's bad. Cheap, yeah, it's cheaper yeah. than black and white. It's it's substantially cheaper than black and white, which is also yes, I remember access that. to color. Yeah, color. I remember that a pack of fifty was like hundred pounds, like Kentman. So not if it, if it raised uh, the price, but yeah. Um, but you can you can do test strips really quickly with color. So my my process of color, um, I started. I've actually got my original, my very first color. Oh, hang on. Let's make it big. Make it big. Over <laughs> oh, oh. And as you can see, the the edges are brown. <laughs> yeah. The image is green. <laughs> but that's an image. Yeah. Mm. That's that's a thing. Um, I found the paper in an envelope, an open envelope in the dark room, hidden under a bunch of other stuff. Um, so I was like, there must be some chemistry around here. There's an enlarger I can use. 
The enlarger didn't have a timer, so I was literally clicking on counting to 10 and then turning it back off. And then developing this in trays with, with warm water and uh, unknown concentration of, of developer. So that's the very first one, mm-hmm. completely just on a whim. <laughs> Plenty of detail. Just the colours are off. Yeah, and, and, and also plenty of colour variation. I mean, you can, yeah. see, you can see there's a <laughs> there's a slant, but um, I mean, so I, this is my first ever on... black and white print. I don't think <laughs> has an image on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was the very first one. So as soon as I got that result, I was over the moon. I got some normal paper. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> That's a huge change. And this one's a slightly blue, just because of the light. But we've got colours, and then from this. I've balanced it so it's it's corrected, um, but you've got. Do you greens, do you yes. have any re- like ritual like okay I start first like correcting the magenta so I start first like putting a base of yellow or like what is your like procedure? What I I usually st- I I have a notebook at the darkroom which has all the previous prints that I've done. Uh huh. I have a. a essentially a, a line for each time I do a, a, a test strip. Um, so usually I start at 40, 0, 40, 35, mm-hmm. um, or some variation of that. Mm. Um, and I go for 10 seconds at F8. That's usually my, like, yeah, base yeah. standard. Yeah. I'll, know, I'll know when that comes out if I'm a stop over or under. Mm-hmm. And I'll know if I'm way off the mark with the colour. If I'm close enough, then I can just tweak um however however many sort of filter points um Mm. the general rule is five for slight changes 10 for moderate changes and then Mm -hmm. 20 for extreme changes um so using that sort of methodology you can work out quite easily how Mm. much to change things Mm -hmm. i want to (laughs) sort of show this book as well (laughs) hang on let me oops sorry hang on there we are so that book, this one's a bit old. I don't think I got this for free. Hang on, it was also, um, is also, is it is this one of the first ever examples of a fake film border? <laughs> well, this is sixth edition, I think. So. Oh wow, it's historic. Yeah, that that. Um, there there is a more recent one. I think they're on ten or twelve for this one, but this has a page for color correction and i use this probably more than anything else Mm -hmm. in the dark room because what it tells you is which filter to change to get back to the center which is balanced Hmm. so then you kind of look at your print and go oh that's a bit too magenta or a bit too orange or a bit too green and then and then you can work yeah 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 working out how much to change and then after a while, you don't need the book anymore. You, you look at something and go, <laughs> it's it's a little bit this colour, change it mm. to that colour. And it becomes really intuitive. And that's the point when you hand it over to the next person and be like, go child, you colour print now. <laughs> so, I mean, for people who haven't done any printing, that might that mm-hmm. might sound intimidating because that might be, that's a lot of testing. But anyone who's done black and white printing knows you never print black and white without a test strip, without a few iterations. Every time that I've just tried to eyeball a negative, I've got it horribly wrong. <laughs> I've wasted 10 minutes. So everyone's sort of used to, I don't know. I mean, how long would it take you on average, do you think, guys, to print a black and white from a negative, to get an actual print you're happy with? 45 minutes, yeah, probably. Exactly. I was about to say, half an hour, best case, 45 minutes hmm. now. How does that compare then to colour for you now? In the morning or in the evening? <laughs> We'll say after one coffee, no beers. Your most productive. And we'll say after three <laughs> coffees, five beers. Um, if if I'm if I'm really on a roll and I want to print more than one frame from a a, a, a sheet of negatives, mm. um, it'll probably take me about half an hour to get to that first negative. Uh-huh. So the turnaround is a lot quicker. Mm. And then every subsequent one will be pretty much the same. So there's one test print and then it's the, the real one usually. You can usually sort of dial it in within mm. in a couple of um, steps. Um, 
in the evenings, it, it, you know, you can spend all evening and then you just can't see which thing to change. Because you've drunk so much beer and yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've all been there. Uh, um, so yeah, it's 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 almost impossible at night um, or later in the day, shall we say. Um, also, you you still have to be in the dark and in, in complete darkness in colour printing. And yeah. I think that puts a lot That's of people the, off. the most difficult part, I think. Compared, mm-hmm. to, yeah. compared to having a red light on. Um, exactly, yeah. The, the trick is um, to have a torch. So you turn on the torch when you need to see something, you turn it off again, and then you just work work around mm-hmm. there. Um, presumably cover the paper. How many hours <laughs> you can spend yeah. on the bathroom? <laughs> Whoa! Oh, wow. It's come up with blood. Oh, days. <laughs> days? Yeah. yeah you, it's, um, it gets a bit stuffy, but yeah. Do you uh, remember what was the, the longest like period of time that you were on the dark room? Like, oh, oh, it has passed like 48 hours. <laughs> I <laughs> could have slept. <laughs> well, um, I didn't sleep, by the way. Oh, did I? <laughs> I mean I've done I've done um sort of after work so sort of get in there about seven o'clock and then stay there yeah. until about two so I've done like late printing sessions before mm. um it, it varies really because you, you also have to be quite motivated to, to spend that time printing course, yeah. mm. whereas if you scan it you've got a whole roll done in like yeah. same amount of time so mm. um yeah so what would you say that is the main difference, printing um, from a scan and printing from the actual negative? For you, how do you feel about it? Like, what's the, like, yeah, I, I print it by hand because I like, for example, what would you say? Uh, you, you can't um, adjust saturation in the darkroom. So so when you, when you have a print... Uh, from from like an inkjet printer, yeah, you can change that digitally and make certain colors more saturated. With color printing, whatever the negative is, that's what you've got, um, and all you're doing is you're balancing the color and getting the exposure right. You can't yeah. then suddenly make one color more vibrant than everything else. And that's that's because if you make if you turn all the colors up, you get the same color balance, but it's just brighter. It's not. Ri- mm. Exactly. So you can't, you don't really have that much control over contrast beyond exposure. Yeah. In the color dark room. Mm-hmm. So there are a few caveats to color printing, but at the same time, you know, that first print that I've got, I mean, that that was a success. Any way you look at it, it's on expired paper. It's completely green, but I can get something out of that. I've uh-huh. got the process down. I know yeah. if I change the colors, I can get them slightly more realistic yeah 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 but off the you know expired paper that's as that's as bright as it will go and i've noticed that you use uh glossy paper is that a no like it's because you, you feel more comfortable with glossy like your photos has to be on glossy or is that any i find reason? they look nicer on color mm-hmm. i find the, the glossy just looks a bit punchier mm. uh-huh. um, I have I've shot with Lustre and Matt as well. You can get those other sort of paper textures. Um, but yeah, I, I think I prefer glossy. <laughs> Do you think that, yeah, I think most of the people that, for example, shoot landscapes of nature, they told me the same thing that I prefer to do it in glossy because the, the, the colors pops out. Yeah, yeah, I kind of get it, yeah. And when you print, do you print slide as well? Well, kind of. <laughs> so, so there's a. I, I, I'll see if I can find the, the name of the, the guy. Like Brendan Barry photo comes to mind mm-hmm. on Instagram. Ah, mm. oh, yeah. Mm. You can. So traditionally, there was a separate process for printing with slide. There was separate paper. There was separate chemistry. Um, Ilford have discontinued it. Mm. and stop making paper, stop making mm. the chemistry. Um, there is a way of printing from slide where instead of putting the your exposed paper into the color chemistry, you first put it into a black and white developer. Okay. Hmm. And you do that in the dark. And what happens is it develops all of the... It develops 
all of the emulsion, but none uh-huh. of the dyes. So what you end up with is a grey inverted image. Okay. Yeah. What you then do is you turn the lights on and then put that into a colour developer and then it inverts in front of your eyes like magic <laughs> and all the colours bloom. Wow, I want to see that. Whoa. There is a, there is a um, video on my Instagram that I've done it if you want to pull that up. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right, let me try and find this because that sounded absolutely amazing. Is it in... <laughs> I've got your Instagram behind this. We can do a share screen in a second. Uh, you know, it might actually be in stories. Oh. What, the, at the moment or not? No. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, oh, wait. On my highlights. On your highlights. Oh, okay. That's okay. Hang on a sec. Wait, which highlights is it? Uh, Dark Room Magic. Dark Room. It's the very first one. Dark room. Oh, here we go. Right, hang on a minute. Ah! Right, hang on. All right, I'm screen sharing. Everyone's going to see something a bit strange for a bit, and then we'll sort it out. Okay, so this is Hussain's Instagram. Excellent. Highly recommend. Um, would watch again. All right, then. Dark room magic. Is everyone ready? Slide film? Oh, let's go back. Start. Right. This is a what looks like a black and white paper and colors coming through it's a bird Whoa. it's a pigeon slide film positive on colorated paper developed in the black and white developed in the dark with black and white then developed in color chemicals with the lights on oh whoa whoa the yellow and the magenta whoa ah it's coming real you can see the <laughs> Wow! So this was you. This was I you then playing that. with it as it was going. Yeah. So if you pull it out early, then you get that in between point where mm-hmm. you've got some of it that's like uh, what's like the swirls, mm-hmm. um, where some of it hasn't quite popped and some of it is still black and white. Well, inverted black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of feels like X Pro, kind of because it is. Um, that is amazing the one with the the ladies with the Japanese dress and then so that monsoon film colour printing (laughs) that was really cool and then a cat okay I think we've just moved on to general oh these are it's actually you know I'm going to let this keep playing because (laughs) to watch colour printing and cats in a dark room wow Okay. So the, the the Japanese one, the Kyoto mm-hmm. uh, kimono one, mm-hmm. um, when you when you overexpose a color print, you tend to you tend to block everything out because all you're doing is you're developing all the dyes over the top of each other. Um, the the dyes and the emulsion they um, dissolve and bleach. So what you can do is you can pour a very soft um, dilution of bleach on and it starts dissolving and melting away the emulsion layer mm-hmm. by layer mm-hmm. so it it dissolves the cyan first then the magenta then the yellow then it's white so anything that's black you get through all of these different layers wow. um, so you can do some really fun stuff if you kind of pour high concentrated bleach on everything and mm-hmm. then tip it because all of the colors they just run off <laughs> Wow. Okay, so I think we've gone from uh, impressing people by how simple colour printing is to then blowing people's minds. Mining I, I, I think though the 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 simple colour printing mm. where you're you're developing an image onto paper yeah. and at whatever resolution, whatever size you want to print at, mm. um, mm-hmm. is really rewarding because otherwise it's just on the screen. True. Yeah. Physical yeah. Copy of it. Exactly. When you, yeah, when you put your photographs in a physical form, it's like, yeah, it's different. The impact that you get from it. And what do you do with your prints, Hussein? Do you do you yeah. paper your bathroom with them? Do you? I I tend to send them to friends and people that want them. Um, I often I often message people to see if they want to to do a print swap. 
Mm, so uh-huh. they'll send me something that they've printed and I'll send them something I've printed. And what about if someone asks you to print a, ne- a negative from them? Like, do you, would you like print, like offer that service for someone, for example? Like, I want you to print my next. <laughs> for a mere what? 500 pounds of print, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> sure, yeah, 500 pounds seems, seems reasonable. Per, per frame? Yeah, per frame. Per, per frame, frame, per copy, per yeah. frame. Uh, are they, is it the, <laughs> uh, are they the, the, the papers? Ah, you have to say, and paper not included. <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> He's told us that's cheap, that's 35p, <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, ultimately, it's, um, if anyone's interested, if you get in touch, I'm sure with E5 we can set up some sort of Hmm. workshop or even if it's online they can sort of live stream it in a similar way hmm. well, I mean, for, That'd be nice. people are definitely uh en- engaging with this one and myself included because i mean you gave me that speech several months ago and i haven't actually made it i mean admittedly this is uh just before everything went into lockdown but um no the way you describe it does make a lot of sense and as i say a lot of us have done editing on digital there definitely is some parallels although there's like the fact that saturation isn't possible is really interesting because that's when you then go back to different films and you know that, you know, Ektar has great saturation versus portrait. Mm. Yeah. That suddenly becomes really relevant. Whereas with a digital camera, you never say a digital camera has great saturation versus everything else. You <laughs> always play with it. Um, you know, resolution or print size or the sensor size, they're fundamental, but saturation is a, an output. Whereas film intrinsically, like grain, like detail, resolving power um, is, is a certain thing. That's fascinating. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we've had people uh, definitely saying uh, interested. Uh, Shirley, very interested. I don't know whether that's in the print swap for class or all of the above. Uh, <laughs> get in touch. Exactly, get in touch. So, Hey Hussain is your Instagram, at, at Hey Hussain. Um, one question I had actually for you was, so, Lomography, when they want when you want to be featured by Lomography's Instagram, you have to do hashtag Hey Lomography. Mm-hmm. To be featured by you, do you do hashtag <laughs> Hey Hussain? And who did it first? I, I think I'm the only. I think I'm the only one that's featured on Hey Hussain at the moment. So <laughs> you're the only I one think, using the hashtag, man. That's why. Yeah, I think so. We didn't realize. Yeah. <laughs> when we, when, when it's not to get my attention. That's the that's the problem. Yeah. All right, Shirley's clarified everything. Everything. All of the. <laughs> Um, no, definitely, and, and again, we've we've print swapped, and it's a wonderful um, uh, nudge to, to receive a lovely print. is a wonderful nudge to make a print yourself and get out. And again, it is tough at the moment. Uh, community dark rooms, um, sadly, aren't one of the government's priorities for whatever reason. Mm. Um, not seen as important to the economy, but um, it will happen over the coming weeks and months. Uh, yeah, there are people who can teach. Uh, her saying we've all learned a lot already there's and, and black and white as well Rachel was helping I saw in the comments um, hmm. having print is a fantastic thing it's also I mean I don't know about you guys one of the most peaceful meditative things you can do with an evening um, I used to print a lot in Yorkshire after a day's work I'd drive over to Leeds and and you go in like still a bit and you come out just because you spend an hour and a half two hours with just Low lights, <laughs> not much. Sound. The, the, the sound of the water, the, just the, the wash yeah. just going, the wash going. People just being very calm and like very complimentary and quiet, and, and it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful. Week. I mean, it, it's also you're you're seeing like really direct consequences to your choices. So if you you know change something, or if if you know if you dodge something, or if you burn something. Mm. you know the effect almost straight away and it's a very like direct action to consequence mm. yeah and i think as well the fact that you it, it completes the picture it completes the analog journey of that image that that was something i saw physically saw took a photo on a mechanical camera mm. went in i've used my iphone as a timer <laughs> it's the most <laughs> it's almost an insulting use of that technology to use it to count <laughs> seconds but sure um and you've come away with something that then is a physical thing that can't be changed where well, you can't go back and tweak it as you say you've set things and also what it always r- reminds me of is um that whole uh 
you know the negative is the the negative is the score the print is the performance analogy in the several mm-hmm. because you can take in a negative and get wildly different final results and again that's that's fine like you can make all your prints really blue <laughs> mm-hmm. if that's what you're after and how do you cope then with printing things like uh, double film and the other ah, ones interesting yeah. last last week we had um revlog on with ribsy and ribsy mm-hmm. was color printing in his bathroom and um and revlog were like we've not had many people color print our stuff mm-hmm. presumably because ah. the color balance you're like which is the real color balance um have you, have you but I've, i know you've done double film I, you, i've I've, I've, that? I've printed um a couple of double films i've printed lomo turquoise and lomo purple uh-huh. um once you kind of get the knack of balancing color and pushing it in one direction or another you kind of see where colors start overlapping and how to pull that back so you can get like a an accurate representation of um the film mm. but again because you don't have the same control over color uh, sorry over saturation yeah something on jelly might not actually be that saturated on the film hmm. so you have to kind of consider that it, you'll get the colors but they not, might not pop as much as they might on screen okay hmm, hmm, hmm. so it's, it's doable and it's it's relatively easy once you've got the knack of balancing color but it's not always the intended uh output and it's do, not what you have in your you mind do it in the way that again i mean and there's a reason by the way that a lot of these digital softwares hark back to this skill. White balance is, yes. is from looking at something that you know should be white and making it white. And hmm. then the print is the thing. Is that what you do? You, you do that kind of like picking something you know is white and working from that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, skin tones are a great like uh, control because mm-hmm. you've got, a, in, like, you've got an, a really good understanding of Mm. that's a bit too blue or that's a bit too green or they look a bit pale Mm. um you can you can tell that really really quickly but obviously if you're doing landscapes it's a lot harder to do so yeah so then you're you're banking on it being less neon green and more orchard green so it's it's that balance and that's i think where having like really fresh eyes helps because you kind of look at something go that's way too blue or that's way too pink Mm. and do you feel that you still have an innate interpretation of colour that's unique? Or do you feel that how people see it is, is, is the same? And the reason I'm asking this is a little bit is like, I know that even within dark, um, in black and white, people's, um, pe- the way people print is, is often a little bit subjective and a little bit different. I mean, I remember reading a book about Ansel Adams where he, especially when he was older, would, pin- would print super dark and just like really got into that. and. That was how he liked his photos. So everyone else was like, "You screwed up some of your best images. Like, stop, right? Stop printing. We'll do it for you." Do you, <laughs> do you look at it and do you see? Do you think that you have a Hussein eye for print in the way that you also have for composition of photos? Or are you I mean, it changes. It, it it changes week by week. Really, um, each time you go into the dark room, um, you're you're not always printing the same print over and over again. So you're printing something completely different. So the best you can do is get it to what you feel like is correct for that image. Mm. And again, because you're restricted somewhat by the end result, the the correct one is going to be the one that's not really off. Yeah. Mm. But then beyond that, you've got very sort of minor adjustments that you can do to to contrast and dodging and burning in the same way that you have in the mm-hmm. in the black and white dark room. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I often don't dodge or burn in the black and white dark room. I do quite a lot in the colour. Because you're playing with colour at different parts in the scene? Yeah, so if if you're if you're hitting the limits of, of the uh, shadows, mm. you can pull some of that detail back because it's not isn't it's not yeah. hitting that limit and pushing past it. So <laughs> you can bring some of that stuff back. Um, and I think this is this is really interesting, actually, the, the yeah. printing, the creative films, because I think this is where, in a digital world, some of them don't make as much sense, because you can get you can get effects like stereo, the one that goes from blue to red across a roll. You can do that digitally relatively easy. I don't understand why you would... You wouldn't necessarily sit and take 36 
photos taken consecutively and randomly mutate them, maybe as a learning experience. But, but the beautiful thing is that when you're printing, that's unavoidable. If you try and color correct it, you will be messing up other things. It is what yeah. it is. Like, you could try desperately to try and, you know, with a Yodica that has some of the color, the rainbow across it, you could desperately try and color correct, but it would never, ever look right. Mm -hmm. That, that is mm -hmm. what it is. Um, there's a limit to how much manipulation of that kind of thing you can have. That's really fascinating, I think. Hmm. The, the, Yodica, actually... the Yodica stuff has actually been quite difficult to print with. Um, just because you get the colours as they're supposed to be, but then the image that you've you've taken a picture of, it gets knocked all the way back. Hmm. So because you don't have quite as much uh, colour representation to contrast balance mm. as you do digitally it's a lot harder to get a really nice like punchy image so mm. would you overexpose when shooting on it then or would that screw something else up i haven't tried i think that's probably the way to go though okay sorry marina i cut you off you were about to ask no, now that we're talking about balance color balancing now i think about photo exhibitions like when like because Hmm. In your case, so, well, first of all, have you ever done a photo exhibition? I guess so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I have to ask. So in your case, um, how do you do to color balancing, color balance, like a whole series of, pho of photograph or do you keep the same like tones and density? Yeah. So how do you do that? Would do you normally like, like start shooting like with the same film? And then, yes, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, the, the consistency is probably key there. It's, yeah. it's, cho it's choosing images from the same roll of film, so it's mm -hmm. gone through the same development yeah. process. Um, because even, even hand-developing stuff, you're going to have very slight variations on strength of chemistry or temperature, mm. or you're going to have you know different grains sometimes. Um, so having some sort of consistency in the series that you select is, is key for that. Um, once you've color balanced one frame on yeah, a roll, I was going to ask you. Yeah. As long as the lighting doesn't change really dramatically from frame to frame, it will be almost identical. Right. For the for the settings for colors hmm. and exposure, if the density is about the same. Because mm -hmm. one thing you you get really comfortable with is looking at a negative, seeing how dense it is, and then mm -hmm. working out the exposure based off that. Mm. so not even having to do the test prints of like seconds mm. but going ballpark that's going to be about 10 seconds that's going to be about 15 seconds mm. especially contrasting from another one that you've just printed mm -hmm. it's like that's a, that's a full three stops you know lighter than that one so mm. and that point you can change the time or you can change the aperture on the, on the enlarger mm. so do you, oh, um, sorry no, I'm sorry <laughs> Do you think that then is really difficult to keep the, the con con consistency? Sorry. So and everything, do you think that is really hard or tricky to get everything like the same tone? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even if, um, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, well, I was uh, talking about color printing, but what about black and white? Do you think it's a lot easier to keep mm -hmm. the same? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the isn't it? It's the element of color balance. Yeah. Um, one thing that I learned with my first print was old colour paper goes brown. So your white balance is going to be brown regardless of what you did to the colours. Huh. Oh, so no. <laughs> expired paper is no good. So you have to get fresh paper. You have to get cold store paper. Hold on, then why you went to Mr. Mr. Cat and you bought I, I will... some kind of <laughs> expired paper? Exactly. Also, it looked like that first photo you showed. It looked like. Do you remember when you did school projects and you have to dip something in tea to make it look like it's really <laughs> yeah. old? It's that that kind of look. Um. So I've actually got some downstairs from that paper I bought that was mm. expired from Mr. Cad. Um. It's. It's not as brown, but it's still considerably brown. Hmm. You can choose negatives that are right. that work well with that kind of base, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's not. It, it won't be true. Basically, it won't be like, and it won't be consistent either. That's the other mm. thing. If you want consistency, oh, yeah. hmm. one uh, a fresh pack of Fujifilm and an old pack of Fujifilm um, will have completely different feeling. And on your ex 
exhibitions, have we ever mixed two different film stocks? Uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. 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 <laughs> No, no, no. It's 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 interesting. And again, anyone who's ever done any exhibitions and try and tried to find a consistency, regardless of whether it's digitally edited, printed, you know that it's the easiest thing to spot at the end is that something's off color wise or contrast, and it just can ruin it. So printing out a match. I'm looking behind me because um, our toddler is uh, is still enjoying life. Are you enjoying the live stream? Is this the thing? She's finding it. Finding it she's finding it very interesting. So so. Robin is enjoying a lot of uh, the colour printing. Um, <laughs> one thing I wanted to... Uh, <laughs> future film photographer, really interested in colour printing, refuses to go to bed until she's, she understands the, the whole spectrum. Um, one thing I wanted to do, actually, Hussein, if you don't mind, is I wanted to share something with you guys, because um, uh, there's something that we're going to do going live with Analog One Land tomorrow um, with Marina. Um, and I think a lot of us, myself included, even though I've heard this, as I say, I heard this, this, this speech, actually, I take it back. I heard the very start of this speech. The last <laughs> half an hour has been unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people saying this. Dale Willett said, never done colour darkroom, learning a lot tonight. Even if I'm not going to yet to use it, it's useful. You will use it, Dale. Maybe not in the next week, but this, this, this is important. Um, one thing I was going to ask the people who are listening is... Um, is, is what we're, we're about to show you. So we're actually a sneak preview of something that's going to go live, hopefully, with all oh. technical things, <laughs> the technical things still to go, uh, go live tomorrow. And we've learned a huge amount from colour printing and we're all fairly down the analogue path, I think it's fair to say. Um, what Marina and I have spent quite a bit of time working on in the last two to three months is um, improving the, the uh, information for people who are just getting into film. Um, and what Marina has done an amazing job of um, is developing a, a, an article, but also a set of videos that go alongside it that is meant to help people who are starting off in film. Now, I know that the people watching, maybe they started film 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or, or six months ago. It doesn't matter. I know this isn't for you, but I wanted to share it with you because A, uh, it's, it's amazing. Marina's done a cracking job. And also then when it goes live, I would love people to help share it with people who are you think would love film photography but maybe a bit intimidated from the very start and i'm not talking color printing uh for an exhibition <laughs> the same will do the videos for that next week it'll be totally they'll be ready for it by then but right we'll just start. Set that down. exactly yes uh something to talk to you about i'm saying marina anything to add about the what you've done um nope <laughs> Please go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so we won't we won't show you the whole thing. There's three different videos. There's an article as well. But again, you guys deserve a sneak preview. Um, also, yes. any feedback, any thoughts when it goes live is always welcome. Um, Please. <laughs> let's let's just have a little bit of look at what's going to see tomorrow. Hola, hello. I'm Marina, and I'm a professional film photographer and the founder of If We Film. And this is the first video of a series of three called the best analog photography guide for beginners in which I'm going to explain the basics that you need to know to start film photography. But one thing, my intention with these videos is to make your entry to the film photography world as easy and clear as possible. That means that I put aside complicated technicalities and I simplified all information as much as possible to give you just the essential things for you. So, with that being said, let's get started. Look, it's possible that film photography could be a little bit intimidating at first, but... That, that is the sneak preview. <laughs> that is the little, little hint of what is to come. Marina, you, 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 you seem worried that that's still showing that. No, it's just that, you know, that I'm not uh, used to, I not, no, I have to get more used to, you know, to, yeah, because I, it's just myself on the screen, it's like a little bit weird. <laughs> so, so, yeah, but anyway, regardless of, uh, like, me uh, feeling a little bit shy, yes, I think, I mean, we, Paul and I, we aimed to, you know, to help as much as we can to people that uh, really want to get into film photography. And I think that, you know, we work really hard to, you know, to break down all the things, the essential things that you need to know. I mean, not getting, as I said, too much technical, but knowing the basics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that, I don't know, I think that mm, I can say that probably is going to be 
very helpful for anyone who's starting film photography. So I hope that you enjoy it, guys, and you share it with people, with your friends, with your family and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, Shirley's already said that she's going to send it to some friends who she thinks uh, will be interested. And that's that's Shirley, definitely thank cool. you. <laughs> One thing is that we noticed um, the sound might be a bit quiet coming through there, but um, that's the thing that we spent today. And by the way, if Rachel's still in the group, Rachel's husband, Adam, has... Uh, Thank you, is Adam. A, a lifesaver, and he's been yes. fantastic. Hussein, <laughs> how did you first learn the very basics of film? Before Marina released her video, obviously. I mean, it was... yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you, are you talking about aperture and exposure times and all that? More like the film side, because I think the the aperture and the ISO obviously carries through, and and but it's like the I always remember the first time I got, I shot 35 mil for a while. Um, and then around the time we first met, I got a Diana and a medium format camera. And I looked at the roll film and thought, what the is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like looking for the sprockets. I'm like, you need to do what? You need to, what? And then I ripped the first two, I think, or three. Like, so it's more like that. You get, you get a, a 35 mil camera or 120. Um, and understanding how film is different to digital rather than the f-stop kind of thing? Uh, probably probably when I bought my first analogue camera, hmm. which was a Fisheye 2. And Lomography used to do a great job at just, here's, here's some rules, break them all. Hmm. And... I kind of learned about sort of the Holger and the fisheye camera and going, you know, your photography doesn't have to be a square frame. And this was before, you know, uh, camera phones. It was before digital cameras really took off. Mm. Um, and it was just like, here's a fun camera. Here's a thing that makes images mm. that, you know, that's, that's their purpose. They're mm. not, their purpose isn't just for documentation. Um, so I kind of learned about film through lomography back in mm. 2006, 2007. Mm. Um, I kind of knew about Polaroids, but they were always out of reach. Yeah. A bit too expensive or, you know, not available. You could get the cameras, but not the film. Yeah. Um, mm. I think that instant photography now is, is so easy to get hold of. It's that same thing of, yeah. here's a camera not in the same way that a professional camera or a studio camera is used for, but it's to have a memento, it's to have these little tidbits of of memories and images. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my sort of origin for film. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because the, I think it, the, the challenge is and, and what, as we, Marina and I talked about this, was the interesting thing is for people who are, coming new to film now are people who have not any awareness. I mean, you talked about your, your grandmother had ABS. You remember going to Boots to sell it. Um, I'm old enough to remember my parents having film cameras when we were on holiday and things. My younger sister, seven years younger, has no memory of that because by that point, our parents had digital cameras. Hmm. So it's almost that I, I sort of remember that concept of the film's wound on, it winds itself back, and I knew what a 35 mil looked like. Whereas my younger sister, it was like, no. <laughs> mm. And that's the thing. And that's what I think Marina's starting with is, is that really lovely. Uh, and it's hard for us, I think, the people who have gone through it to, to understand what somebody who is 18, 19, 20 year old is coming to analog. But also that, I think, is, as you think about the industry and the community, that's where the future will be. Uh, mm. I don't know whether that's your experience. Well, like, if, do you know people now who see you with a film camera and are like, oh my God, what's that? Like, what are the questions that they have at that very beginning start? Um, that you can't see, you can't see the yeah. picture that you've taken. Um, <laughs> that's that's the, probably the one I get the most. Question, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, I, to be fair, I, I had a little digital point and shoot long before I had a film camera. Mm. Um, so I kind of learned how to take photos in the same way that someone using their phone camera might do mm. is is a little bit more i mean you could only take you know 30 or so high-res photographs on a tiny point and shoot and by high-res you mean 
two, three megapixel, you right. know, yeah. yeah, you know, it's things that we take for granted now. Um, but now you've got this uh, background context of filters. Mm. So your images are, you know, whatever you want them to be and as fun as in- interactive as you want them to be. But also I didn't have access to video when I was learning about photography. Mm. Now video, TikTok, Instagram stories, that is the norm. Mm. And stepping back from that is this like one picture. You can't see it for two weeks. And even when you see it, you might not like it. So <laughs> it's this very like distant relative of what is normal now. So, mm. but I think that's a good thing as well. It's, it's a nice contrast. Mm. To then go, oh, look, you don't like it? Well, you can do all this other amazing stuff to it through a darkroom. Or, you know, if you don't like it, try a pinhole camera and see what happens there. Mm -hmm. Um, Try a Polaroid lift. You know, try all these things that you're physically doing rather than um, something that's very, you know, 15 seconds and that's it. Or 15 seconds and that's it 500 times. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's funny actually I um, when you say about the filters I had someone the other day um, emailing about film recommendations and, when, and one of the um, you know they're just getting to film they're, they're young they've, they've got a camera and so on and I mentioned Ektar and they were like oh like the like the film preset and I was like uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes <laughs> like the film presets like the film like the presets like the film yes yes like the presets so I'm assuming that they <laughs> new a Fuji digital camera and I'm assuming X has one of the options it gives mm. um, but then you've turned into the old man shaking his fist about you know <laughs> Photoshop not understanding where all of these terms come from exactly dodge and burn yeah yeah <laughs> exactly and, and to be clear I didn't say anything but I did <laughs> I did pause and be like like that yes mm-hmm. <laughs> but no it, it is interesting and, and um, I mean, again, like I made that thing this evening when you're talking about color printing. I'm, I'm reaching for Photoshop analogies when in reality it's the other way around, and Photoshop is designed by people who knew color printing. Oh, it's all photography in the end, you know. Um, <laughs> Rachel's just typed in as well, saying uh, she says uh, she always enjoys the. It's just like HD. <laughs> yes, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Um, we're getting, we're getting, <laughs> we're only close to the two hour mark. We're definitely over an hour and a half. The same, we've taken up a huge amount of your, um, of your, uh, Thursday evening. Thank you so, so much for it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for indulging me with your, <laughs> your interest in colour. <laughs> no, 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 it's not an indulgent. Like, I mean, Ribsy mentioned it last week, almost in passing. And, and we, it was right at the end of the time with Revelog and they were an hour earlier. So we kind of had to wrap it up. And there was so much I wanted to then dive in, and you could see people be like, "That's interesting," especially with the so, <laughs> No, you've 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 definitely helped us a huge amount. Yes. You've, um, you've I think you've inspired a lot of people in the in the comments and people who watch this later to, um, to to get into color printing. I mean, my summary is: starting color printing is uh, easy. There's a lot of fun things to then do with it. <laughs> you don't need to start with the slide film black and white reversal no. <laughs> shove it in bleach and see what happens approach that is that is advanced uh but the actual basics of creating a print from negative um isn't as scary as you think and hussein is 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 wonderfully well placed to um to 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 answer any questions so i'm going to try and type this up let's see how uh this works at the same time so if people want to find you on instagram it is at hey hussein that's correct oh and i brought it up in a little blue box as well um so yes if people are interested in <laughs> color printing please please do ping you so you're part of the e5 um dark room um, mm-hmm. which is tina's one as well process. right mm-hmm. yeah so tina Rowe. if anyone watched the um the black lives matter episode a couple of weeks ago um same same dark room um please ping hussein please ask questions when this is all over hussein has promised us all a master class is what i've taken from today <laughs> i will sure, be there yeah. marina would you be there Yep. Yep. I, w- I will have shot Revelog and Yodica just to see what happens. <laughs> give give us a challenge. Um, and Retrochrome, maybe. Something something funky. Um, we will shoot a black and white reverse film. 
Yes, exactly. Or we'll bring some <laughs> Adox Scarlet and she'll be like, colour fruit that. It's black and white. Um, <laughs> no, thanks so much, everyone who's watched, who's asked questions, who's got involved. Hussein, once again, thank you so, so much. Um, it is thank wonderful you to have too. you on. Um, if everyone can send abuse to Graham as well, just saying, like, thanks, Graham. <laughs> Why didn't you get him on? What's wrong with you? That would be wonderful. We or will just in general. Or general abuse. Yeah, actually, you're right. It doesn't need to be specific. Why, why limit yourself? Pick a topic and go with it. Um, Marina, thank you as ever as well. And, um, Thanks to you. And yeah, e everyone tomorrow, look out for the videos. Look out for the article from Marina. If we can solve Thanks. all the last technical problems, it'll be live by lunchtime or the afternoon. Yeah. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then, yeah, please send it to all of your friends who, who are then going to learn to shoot film. And in two years' time, we'll be, we'll be attending Hussein's uh, Colour Printing Masterclass. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Good evening. Good night. Bye-bye.